Are you ready? Sit down, turn off the TV, and tell everyone around you to shut the f up. Because it's time for Same Sex Dialogue Podcasts, where you'll hear the most entertaining discussions about gay topics, current events, and news. We speak our minds and nothing is off the table. Now, here are your hosts, K Town and the super sexy fashion queen herself, Kim Style. Hey guys, thank you for joining us for another episode of Same Sex Dialogue. And today we do have a very special guest on the show. His name is Peterson Toscano, and this is episode 14. The name of this is Can Gay Be Cured? So, Peterson, are you here with us today? I am. It's great to be with you. Hi. Hey. <laughs> We're so glad We're you joined us. We're trying, and it, we, it's taken a lot of champagne, Peterson, <laughs> but it's getting me through. It's getting me through. I don't like the cold at all. I can't wear open-toed high heels, so you know that gets me down. <laughs> you kidding me, <laughs> You know I have them on. I have them on actually wearing them through the house because, <laughs> because we're snowed in and I can't wear them out. <laughs> She's not kidding either. I am. You should, you should post a picture of my shoes today. Oh, They're real. sexy. <laughs> anyway, this is Ken Style, and I've been so excited for a whole week. Actually, Peterson, I've had my nails done, my hair done. <laughs> I've had a pedicure. You know, the I, you you know, know the I, previous show. Yeah, do do I sound skinnier? <laughs> because I, I juiced knowing you were going to be on our show, and I've lost three pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know I found those three pounds, by the way. I lost them, you found them. That's what being snowed in will do for you every time. You either gain weight or get pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and I ain't about no baby bump. I don't know about you. <laughs> yeah, no, we're in the same boat there, yeah. Okay. Um, Peterson, are you a drinking champagne like we are? No, I, it's just bubbling over. I mean, that's kind of like why I like your show. I like all the gig play. It really doesn't matter what the topic is. I just like the laugh. It, our, it makes me feel happy. Our energy is up, baby. Our energy is up. <laughs> well. What else? Do we have any, like, announcements or anything? Oh, yeah, I do. I have one. I have one. I have one, guys. Okay, so right now you know that um, most people are listening to our show via iTunes, right? Or... There, you, you guys are downloading our app, which is um, for Google, but we just got uh, some news that Google is actually going to be supporting podcasts now through Google Music. So I did um, go ahead and get our podcast lined up to be launched when that happens, I think in a couple of months. So um, because right now there's a really, really big gap between uh, people that listen to our podcast that have iPhone and Android users. So we're going to be able to pick up all those um, faithful Android users that have been actually going to Spreaker right now to listen to our podcast. Um, and that's that's good news. So more fans, more laughing and giggling for us. <laughs> we We love that, and we're very happy to say that. So hang in there, Android users. In, in the meantime, you can download our, our app from the Google Play Store. It's completely free. Listen to all of our uh, episodes. Join in on the chats uh, if you would like, and that's how that's going to go. So uh, one more thing. Any, I do want to say something. Um, the last couple of times, we could not remember our own <laughs> phone number. <laughs> Um, so you, you guys can actually call and leave us a voicemail at Same Sex Dialogue. And that number is 865-309-5429. That's the number. <laughs> <laughs> I, I apologize for not knowing that right offhand, but it was funny when I realized I didn't know One of fans had to call in and tell it to us. I'm so embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed. It happens, babe. So, all right. So do you have anything else? Um, I think that's it. I, yep. I, I opted to skip the email for, I, I know I have a lot of emails to answer and I promise you maybe next time I'll get to two or three, but 
I really just wanted to get to Peterson today because he has so many yummy good things to talk about. Oh my gosh, he's been in various articles, movies, films, radio, TV show, many others that we get to ask him about and pick his brain. Oh my gosh, yeah. and can you tell I'm excited? Yes, you're very excited. <laughs> I can tell. I, he, Peterson, I, I have never in my life seen so much information on someone. I mean, we really didn't really know where to start, so... Um, we're hoping that, um, you know, if, if the, I'll tell you this, if there's anything you want to say that we don't ask you, feel free. Okay. Cause this is all about you. And we're very grateful that you contacted us and wanted to be on our show. That's very flattering. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> very flattering. My turn. The first question I want to ask you today is can heterosexuality be cured? <laughs> There's definitely been some gay guys I know trying to convert straight guys. I've seen that happen, you know. Um, so I would say that the, it's a temporary cure, uh -huh. um, uh, and that by the next day everything is sort of forgotten. Uh, oh, I've after heard. the blowjob? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> oh, so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> well, you know, if, if you're real, if you're straight, you know, for that straight guy that's really struggling with his heterosexuality, if he if he wants to make, you know, just give it a shot, you know, you can always try, and then you know, if you realize it's not a good fit, just carry on in your mundane heterosexual life. But you know, God loves the heterosexual too. You know, it's, yes, it's, it's yes, she true. does. She and sure does. Hope for the heterosexual. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Um, all right, so seriously, this is uh, what I would like to ask you. Um, you know, uh, you do many things, but how would you describe exactly what it is you do? Well, um, I gave myself a title of a theatrical performance activist because what I do is I take really serious issues like gay conversion therapy, uh, transphobia, climate change, uh, injustice of all sorts. I take serious issues, and then through storytelling and through comedy, I try to communicate to people. And, and basically the goal is to bring people closer to hot topics. It, it all started when I first emerged after 17 years of being in various gay conversion therapy and ex-gay ministries. I came to my senses and came out of the closet and began to tell people about it through a comedy called Doing Time in the Homo Nomo Halfway House. <laughs> and, <laughs> We've read and a little like, bit about that, actually, and that it, we do have questions about that. I hope you're willing to elaborate because... But go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go go ahead. ahead. But, you know, that was the beginning of realizing, ah, when it's a topic really that's serious and even tragic, it's really important to to tell personal stories and to use comedy when, when possible to help relax people. And as a result, I've been able to talk to you know, tens of thousands of people throughout North America, Europe, South Africa, about LGBT issues, about white privilege, about climate change, uh, which is my latest uh, issue that I've been taking on. And these are rough issues that kind of shut people down often, but I've found that through comedy and storytelling, people open up. Yeah, you know what, Peterson, what's funny that you would say that, I'm friends with a lot of gay guys, and, and they're all so funny. And I asked one of them one time, I said, Charlie, why are you, I mean, how are you guys so funny? I mean, I was in Stitches, I'm, I'm in Stitches all the time. And he said, well, Kim, it takes a comedy to get through, you know, we were uh, harassed and bullied as a child. And comedy and, and fun in people just get you through that painfulness of how we were raised and made fun of and picked at. Is that, is that how you deal with that? Or you're just funny yeah. in general? 
Well, you know, I, I learned a lot from uh, comics and people doing solo shows. And if you think about it, the fun, some of the funniest people in America are people who come from an oppressed minority. You had we have Lily Tomlin, who was one of the first one-woman shows, you know, lesbian. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg, John Leguizamos. Uh, you've got people who experienced depression and often were kind of isolated, able to use comedy and also multiple characters where they become other people in order to work through that pain and in order to expose injustice. Right. Uh, and so it, it makes sense that that happens and that the one person show in particular has come out of that tradition. Right. At, at what age did you know you were gay? I knew I was different from other boys from a very early age. Uh, my first memory actually was on a boat that my parents had with my uncle. They would go on the Hudson River, and it was like a little cabin cruiser with a little sleeping quarters. And my uncle, um, who was in the Marines with my dad, had just put up new curtains. And there were these little white lacy curtains, and I just thought they were the most beautiful thing I had ever seen in my life. <laughs> and here I am, a little boy, five years old, just taken by the window treatment, you know? Oh. And, you know, it just, I just went over to touch them, and my uncle slapped my hand. He's like, why are you going to put your dirty hands on my curtains? And I'm thinking to myself as a kid, who would ever put dirty hands on those curtains? Oh, you That's were just crazy. wanting to feel the texture. <laughs> I, I did. I really did. And, okay. you know, that's a, a gender difference. You know, that, you know, that, you know, not, well, it, it could be a gender difference. I mean, obviously boys are interested in fabrics as much as girls, but it was the earliest indication that I was not acting the way I was expected to act. And then, of course, as I got older and began to have crushes on male teachers and on guys in my class and then puberty hit, I realized, oh, yeah, I'm definitely gay. Yeah. But to to accept that was more like accepting the diagnoses of a, a terminal disease. Absolutely. Because it was not a cool time to be gay. Yeah. Right. Well, let me let me say, let me ask you this. At that time when you, you knew you were gay, did you think it was wrong? Yeah, I mean, everything told me it was wrong. I mean, the playground, you know, what would you be called? Gay. If you were, you know, it was the worst thing you'd be called or fag or fairy. You had the rise of the moral majority, so you had these preachers on TV, national television, preaching against homosexuals. Don't even and, get me and, like, started. Homosexual threat. I What's know. That? I said, don't even get me started on TV <laughs> evangelists. Right. And yeah. So, and that, but they, you know, that's when, like, you know, Pat Robertson was running for president. Oh my god. And gosh. so he was not just a religious leader, but he was a political leader. And then, as I'm a teenager, what hit? But this plague which was first known as GRID, the Gay-Related uh, Immune Deficiency, oh. which later got renamed as HIV-AIDS. Oh, but as a oh, teen, okay. all I ever heard about it was gay cancer or God's punishment against homosexuals. Uh -huh. I heard that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, you know, all those things added together to make, it, make me realize, you know, the message I was getting was not that it's just wrong to be gay, but it's dangerous. It'll kill you and send you to hell forever. Absolutely. I thought and the same thing. that's the soup I would swim in. And you too, right? Yes, yeah. yes. That's the brainwashing we all got. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, it, and that's what made your feeling of the need to be cured as you got a little older? You felt like you needed to be cured at this point? Or what point did you feel that? It was started around when I was 15, and I realized that if I were straight and if I were more masculine, I would have a better life. And I saw, saw that, and I, who wanted to be rejected? And I was particularly afraid that my parents might reject me. So before they even had the chance, I began praying to God to fix me and began to connect with um, various religious folks to help me. Uh, to find a cure, and at one point, I was raised Catholic, but at one point I met these Pentecostal Christians, and they said, at our church, God does miracles. He has saved drug addicts, prostitutes, and even homosexuals. <laughs> like, that was like the worst thing you could possibly right, yeah, right. Like, yeah. Crap, that's me. And then they were like, no, but Jesus can transform you. 
And that got me on this this track to try to get fixed for Jesus. Right. So so as a young young man, did you have any relationships? Did you ever explore that? I mean, do you have any relationships with, you know, other males or I did, yeah. You know, I, I don't know. There was like a hotbed of, of homoerotic play going on in my little <laughs> upstate New York town. I won't name names, of course, but of there course. was a lot of experimentation. But what was interesting is, you know, I'd experiment with other boys my age, but they would sort of grow out of it, and they weren't interested anymore. And I think they were genuinely straight or bi and not really interested but that interest didn't go away. It just grew. And I actually wanted a boyfriend, but that was just not even a possibility. You know, that didn't exist. Right. Okay. Well, um, just in reading uh, up about you, I found that you have, it said you had spent over $30,000 and 17 years trying to cure yourself of homosexuality with many years spent at Love in Action in Memphis, Tennessee. Tell us how you came to that decision. Well, you know, <laughs> I had a bad case of the gay. So I was really working hard to get rid of it, and I tried all kinds of things, ex gay support groups, most of it in New York City, actually, okay. where I was living, where I had exorcisms and support groups and counseling, and even got married to a woman for five years. But then after everything, all that, my marriage had fallen apart. I was still very gay yeah. and troubled about it. I decided maybe I'm not being serious enough about this. Right. And that's when I found out about Love in Action, which was a residential program in Memphis. So I moved to Memphis to get in touch with my inner Elvis. <laughs> and, to bring out that <laughs> and I enrolled in the Love in Action program and was in that program for two years. Wow. Well, let me let me ask you this, okay? Oh, so, wait, can I ask him one more thing about Love in Action? <laughs> yes. Did... You don't fight now. <laughs> <laughs> We're fighting over you today. How's that feel for two lesbians to be fighting over you? I'm sure it's not the first time. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, I Go lost ahead. train of thought. But, you, no, okay. uh, it was about love. And, oh, oh, oh. And I'm sure this isn't new news, but it's new news to us and maybe some of our listeners. That the uh, What is your relationship with the president of Love in Action right now? With John Smith, um, okay, so John Smith was the guy who was the executive director for the longest time and when I was there, and uh, he was protested in 2005 because some teenagers were there against their will, and ultimately he resigned from the program, and then he uh, apologized about his role in promoting gay reparative therapy and XD ministry, and he renounced it. And at one point, he actually sent me a personal apology. We've been in communication for years because okay. I've done a lot of activism around this program. And initially, I rejected his apology. I can imagine. Because, yeah, I mean, for one, it was very painful to even hear from him. And after the very, very cruel things that happened in that program towards me and my family. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we continued to chat a little bit through email, and he finally sent me a written apology, and I read it, and I struggled because it was sincere, but it was incomplete. So I printed it out, and I rewrote it, and I sent it, I sent it back corrected, and I said, now, this is what an apology would look like. <laughs> right. I don't know if you can give this apology, but that's what I'd be able to receive. And he sat with it, and, um, and, and you know, ultimately, he, he did um, really own up to all those things. And, um, and so it was, it's been a tense relationship at times because I saw him as an abuser in right. my life. Right. And in a way, in regards to activism, I've become somewhat of a, someone who really challenged him to, to think deeper. And, uh, I know he's now, um, he's now married to a man. He's living in Texas and, um, he's living a new life. And so I, I, you know, 
I'm really grateful for his willingness to stand up and speak about those things. Well, I don't really see us as friends, friends today, just because our relationship was never friendly. But you know, I I, I really hope he he has does the best in his life and he's he's happy. Yeah. Um, and that he continues to undo the damage that he had done. That speaks volumes for the person that you are. You have a question? Yeah, it really does. And I know we overstepped a little bit. Uh, we were going to ask you about him, but thank I'm, you for that answer. It's okay, yes, Kim. It's, it's absolutely okay. Great. But I want to know um, what was the philosophy uh, of love in action? The philosophy was what was like in most ex gay programs that there's something fundamentally wrong and unnatural about being gay that somehow our naturalist state would have been straight and something corrupted us to make us gay. In Love and Action, they, um, they believe it had something to do with the family, that uh, you weren't raised properly. So maybe mom was too strong, dad was too weak. This is sort of old, debunked, refried Freud, basically. Right. And they would, you know, use that. And, and then they actually had family and friends weekends when they brought in our family and friends. And this is pretty, this is where it gets diabolical, actually. So when you enter the Love and Action program, every week they had us write these things called moral inventories, where we basically had to write about a sexual incident in our life. So it could be having sex with somebody. It could be some fantasy we had. We had to write three of these a week, actually, and explain what was going on and why it was wrong and how we were sick and dysfunctional. After writing these for weeks, you'd have a pretty big collection of them. Then they said, okay, Family and Friends Weekend is coming up. We want you to go through all of these stories and pick out the most shameful story you could find. The one that you are most embarrassed about. What? And when your family and friends come, and they're all there in the room, each of you are to stand up and read your most shameful sexual experience oh, in gosh. front of your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sisters, your captors. That's mortifying. It, we really, it was horrible. It was so awful. And, um, and, you know, and, and but the day before all that, they sat down with the parents and they went through this whole big training and said, well, you know, your kid's gay because of family dysfunction. Um, you may not be aware of it, but there probably was problems in your home. You may not be aware of it, but your, pro your child was probably sexually abused. And so these parents who just want to be parents are getting dumped on. And then the first time they see us, that whole weekend, we stand up and we unload these stories. How sad. How embarrassing. It was yes. uh, awful, awful, awful. So at Love in Action, they had that sort of model. In other programs, it would be it was demons or it was you know bad uh, gender roles. But in every case, it's always like, this isn't natural. Something that was good got broken, and we're going to try to fix it. And, um, and, of course, you can't fix something that's not broken. Right, um, right. What you do is you just create more brokenness and harm and pain and confusion, which is ultimately what happened to many of us who went through programs like Love and Action. Right, right. right. That, that is very, very sad and heartbreaking to hear. It really is. I'm almost in tears. But, oh, so that was the emotional abuse. What about yeah. what about physical abuse, if any? Um, you know, in Love and Action, I didn't experience any physical abuse. I, I mean, in a way, the most dangerous people in our lives at that point were ourselves because we were turned against ourselves um, because we were told that we, you know, if we failed, basically it was our responsibility to and so I, I know that people walked away from Love and Action with all kinds of physical ailments, you know, stomach problems and back problems. And, and you know, all this pressure we kept putting on ourselves was just really, really uh, damaging to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why, you know, after we all emerged, you know, some of us got together to figure out how do we recover from this mess? Because... Mm -hmm. Bad enough we lost those years, but we're not going to lose the rest of our lives. 
Right. It's funny you would say stomach problems because I, I mean, you know how when you're on the internet and you're researching something, one thing leads to another. And I did listen to this guy that had gone through some therapy such as yourself. And he was saying that the, I mean, he went through all this uh, abuse and it was like he was put into shock therapy with his hands or something maybe when he would see like a pornography with two men together he'd be shocked and he said the first and he got out of that therapy he's like I know I'm gay he was standing in high heels as he's speaking and he said the first time he kissed his first boyfriend he threw up yeah and I just was wondering that about you. Was it that horrific for you? Well, you know, I had to relearn everything. I think the first thing, I was terrified of gay people and lesbians because I had learned so many bad things that were not true about who gays and lesbians were. When I first came out, I was like, who do I go to? Because the church doesn't want me. And, and I was told horror stories about like what the gay community was like. So thank goodness, there's this wonderful minister in Memphis I met named Timothy Meadows uh, at Holy Trinity Church, and he he saw that I was a you know a person struggling to get part of the community. And at that time, it was soon after that was soon after Matthew Shepard was killed, and oh, Judy gosh. Shepard, his, yeah yeah, so it was intense time. And Judy Shepard, his mom, came to Memphis to speak. Then this pastor said to me, he said, hey, why don't you do something? Why don't you, you, you like to write? And said, why don't you write a poem for the event about the gay community here in Memphis? And I was like, wait, what? Okay, A, I'm a Yankee. What do I know about Memphis? And two, I came out like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> so like, you're asking the wrong person. Right? And he said, well, here's a list of names and numbers. And he connected me with you know, lesbian moms and bisexual baseball players and, mm-hmm. and transgender accountants and all kinds of people. And I interviewed all these people. And I, and each interview was another healing experience of, oh, I've been lied to. There are all kinds of people in our community, people of faith and, and, and you know, really good moral people and people involved in all kinds of things. And that was a really important experience to have, to undo some of the bad teaching I had. Right. Okay. Um, well, we have a um, a listener that wants to know, his name's Michael, wants to know whether your parents were supportive or th- what your journey to that, you know, wanting to de-gay yourself, was it brought on by your parents? You know, my parents are exceptional people. They, um, they were, you know, we, I grew up in an Italian-American Catholic family, and their whole thing was they wanted us happy. Now, growing up, they never said anything bad about gays, and they never said anything good about gays. So in that silence, I was concerned that if I came out gay, they would reject me, which would be the worst rejection I could possibly face, because I just loved them so much. So before they had that chance, that's when I went on the track to try to fix myself. And then... Through the years, you know, they, they knew that I was doing that, and they didn't say much. And, and they admitted to me afterwards, at first they were, they thought it was probably a good idea that I tried to change, because they knew how gay people were treated in the world, and they didn't want their kids to experience that. Right. But then, as the years went by, and I became more depressed and distant from them and unhappy, they got concerned. To the point when they finally came to love and action, they were very concerned for me and my well-being. And at that time, they were like, we don't care if he's gay or straight. We just want him well. And when I finally came out and I contacted them, I wrote them a little letter because I was too chicken to call. And I was like, dear mom and dad, I'm gay. Really. Yeah. yeah. Love your son. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even after all the therapy, I'm still gay. <laughs> I'm still gay, just so you know, just an update, status update. Um, and, um, and they're both New Yorkers, and so my mom's on the phone, you know, and she, you know, she calls me, and she's on the phone, and I could just see her with a cigarette in one hand, a cup of coffee in the other, mm-hmm. and, uh, I, and I guess, like, hi, Mom, she goes, so, you know, so you got my letter? And she goes, yeah, we got your letter. And, I goes, and, and she says, it's about time. Oh, God! <laughs> 
Ross. Kudos to her. Then she says, but your father wants to talk to you. Uh-oh. And that's when I'm, like, getting freaking out because he was, like, a U.S. Marine. He's kind of a tough guy. He gets on the phone, and he has this really funny way of talking. He was like, all right, son. Um, so you were flying upside down, and now you're trying to fly right. But you know what? You can't make a fish fly. Aww. <laughs> sweet. Like, That's really good to hear. It was so sweet. And, yeah. Um, sadly, my mom passed away in uh, 2006, and my dad passed away in 2012. But before he died, he was able that summer to go to my wedding with oh, my husband, Glenn, and yes. he was Great. the bell of the ball. He yes. had such a good time. Congratulations. Was, I'm so glad. Thank awesome. you. Yeah, awesome. absolutely. Awesome. That's awesome news. I'm, I'm happy about that, your relationship with your parents, and that has to be comforting. That's a good feeling because you never had that yourself, did no, you? No, no. I, I, my parents both have passed away, and I never got that from them. So yeah. cherish that, Peterson. Um. I know that you have dealt with being at Love in Action, but we are just learning about this. Can we ask just a few more questions about that? Sure, of course. When you, okay, were you, what was your moment of awakening and making the decision to leave that horrific place? Well, I graduated Oh, oh. Program. oh, did you get a diploma? <laughs> graduate. And um, there was even talk about me coming back and working for the place because often many of the people who run these places are former clients. So it's almost as if you never leave the program. But I was like, let me live on the outside for a while. Let me just see if this took this whole long treatment. And so I lived, you know, on my own for a while and then. Suddenly there was this one weekend I had a relapse of sorts. It was kind of a whole relapse weekend, basically. Hmm. Hmm. What'd you do, go to the gay bar? (laughs) 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 I I didn't just, like, fall off the wagon. I, like, kind of flew off the wagon. (laughs) Rolled around off the wagon. Anyway, on that Monday morning when I came to my, you know, clean myself up, and I was like, what the, what the? I called, I called up John Smith, actually, at Love and Action. I said, oh, my gosh, I had this horrible weekend, and it was kind of fun, but it was horrible all the same, and, and I, need to get, I need more help. He said, come on back. We'll give you a relapse program. I was oh, like, gosh. Really? Um, and so if you think you're crazy once for going in the homo no more halfway house, yeah. you're really crazy to go twice. So I went back in. <laughs> <laughs> what in for, you know, no one could say I didn't try, right? Aww. So I went back in for more treatment, and then finally, I think we, I didn't really graduate the second time. I think we all just got tired of each other, and they're like, we can't do any more for you. Good luck. <laughs> Good and luck. It was about two months after that, as I was waking up one day, and I had, fortunately, I had been to a counselor a few weeks before who really helped me, a Christian counselor who really helped me, because... Part of my trouble with overcoming being gay was there has been some sexual abuse in my life as a, as a child with an older, uh, an older boy in my neighborhood. And that confused me because right. it, it gave me a complicated relationship with my body and my sexuality. It didn't make me gay because I was attracted to guys before that, but it, it inserted shame Aww. in a place that there shouldn't have been. And actually, the church and the XK movement capitalized on that shame because they're like, you feel bad about being gay, right? And it was true. I felt bad, but it, it wasn't really about being gay. It was about my sexuality just because I had been tampered with at a young age. Do you, can and I intervene I, right I, here? I, yeah. You just made, you just jarred a, something in my head because I, like I said earlier, I have a lot of gay guy friends, and I will tell you, 99.9% of them were sexually abused, and I by all means don't think that made them gay, but I think the predators prey on those maybe more effeminate little boys. Am I wrong? I'm just trying to figure it out. Am I wrong? No, I think that I think that's been shown to happen. I mean, I know in my case at least, I was I was different from the other boys. I was, you know, 
you know, I, I think people can tell that I was different and maybe even identify that I was gay. And I loved the attention. You, you know, I really wanted, you know, the male attention. And it was taken advantage of uh, in, in that sense. So, yeah, I, could, I can see how that happens. Um, and, and that's the problem because people then say, oh, well, see, that's why you're gay. I'm like, no, no, that's why I'm unhappy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was unhappy about my sexuality. Um, it didn't make me gay. It actually made me ex-gay. It made me more vulnerable and open to these bad teachings. Yeah. Because I felt this, something bad about myself. But thank goodness I sat with this Christian counselor who actually was trained, which isn't true of all Christian counselors. He was a trained therapist. And I was talking about the abuse thing and how much pain it was giving me. And he looked me in the eye and he said something. Like when you know when somebody says something and it like, it hits you and it sets you free. It resonates he, with you. Right. It does. And, and may, I may even have heard it before, but suddenly that moment I heard it. He looked at me and he said, you know, Peterson, there's a difference between being gay and being abused. Absolutely. Amen. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. Is this the Tim- when, Timothy when Meadows? He, when he cut through that mess that was all balled up together, that changed things for me so that two months later... I woke up one day thinking about my day and how I don't want to be gay and I have to avoid going to this place and I shouldn't look at this magazine. And suddenly I was like, wait, what the hell are you doing? This is crazy. And it was like my brain got cleared up all of a sudden. Like I woke up from a coma. I actually actually refer to it as waking up from a biblically induced coma. I think I read that somewhere in your notes. And, and, and it was like, so suddenly my brain was clear. But I, I know that those words that I heard months before helped begin to free me because I no longer got, had the, the bad feelings mixed up with being gay. It was a separate issue. Oh, that's abuse, and that needs to be dealt with with therapy or whatever. But this is about being gay. It's an orientation. It's, it's natural. It's fine. Mm-hmm. And that helped me a great deal. Right, mm-hmm. right. Peterson, do you think they actually ever cured anyone? You know, people who went to the ex-gay program went for lots of different reasons, and no two people's sexuality are identical. I Mm -hmm. mean, there are all sorts of bi people in the world. There are people, again, who are dealing with other issues that then make their sexuality complicated. So the people who maybe were went to these programs who were really out of control at times sexually with risky behavior that they couldn't stop, um, possibly sex addiction. I mean, this had nothing to do with being gay. This happens to straight people too. But, of course, it was added on with all the shame and the stigma of being gay in a society that made it really clear that there was something wrong with LGBT people. So I think some people at times found some help in in dealing with addiction issues, with some of their control issues. But ultimately, most people were harmed because they were reinforced with this negative message that there's something terribly wrong with you on the inside. I mean, I know people today who say they were gay and now they're married and they say they're happily married and some of them are actually friends of mine. but I, you know, I still don't believe anyone actually changes their orientation. And even in Love and Action, this was the dirty little secret. You walked in the door after reading all their ads of find freedom from homosexuality to Jesus Christ. They sit you down, and the first thing they told us was, don't expect to have these desires go away. Yeah. You're going to be dealing with these feelings for the rest of your life. Yes. We just need to know how to tamp them down, to manage them, to suppress them. And so they never actually promised to cure anybody. They just want to change identity and behavior. Hmm. And some people, you know, some people who like men can also be in a healthy, um, successful relationship with a woman. They may be bisexual or there may be things in that relationship that's really valuable to them, the companionship, the children, whatever. Um, We're all wired differently. Yes, Um, we are. But just because you're living with a woman doesn't mean that you're now cured. And it's irresponsible to use your life as an example because it, it, it 
leads other people to the wrong conclusion that such a thing is possible mm -hmm. and, and, and such a thing is even worth pursuing, which is so unnecessary and so not worth it. Yeah. Well, I'm getting ready to open up a new can of worms, and I already <laughs> I already know the answer to this, but I want to ask you this for our listeners, actually. As a Bible or a biblical scholar, do you think that by being homosexual, you are committing a sin? Um, well, I have seen homosexual sin before. Usually it's fashion choices. Oh! <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I've seen, you know, but God bless them. You know, they, you know, as, as you say so beautifully, you know, this is one, an expression I miss in the South when, when people just say, well, bless his heart. Bless his heart. You know, bless his heart. He meant well. I say um, that on a daily basis, <laughs> Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is the problem. It's. You know, people look at the Bible and they look at these weird stories, like the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. People just would say for years, like, well, God condemns homosexuality because look at what happened in Sodom. I'm like, yeah, can we just for a second look at what happened in Sodom? Because that's a weird-ass story. Yes, it is. And a lot of crazy things happen in there. And it's not really anything to do with being gay. So, like, you have this city that a lot of people don't realize, you know, and it, it's it takes place in the city Sodom. Well, years before in Sodom, there was a horrible attack, and Lot was living there, and Abraham got involved and got an army together to rescue Lot, Lot because they were attacked. It was like their own 9-11, where they were attacked, and the women were raped and men were killed. It was a horrible, horrible trauma. Mm -hmm. And so they lived with this fear of outsiders. And Lot is an outsider, and suddenly there are these strangers showing up at his house. And it's very curious, and people are wondering, is this some sort of terrorist cell going on here? Mm -hmm. And all the men in the city of Sodom, young and old, gathered outside the house, demanded that Lot send out these visitors so that they could have sex with them. Now, I know, some people are saying, well, that sounds pretty gay to me. It mm -hmm. seems like there's going to be some man-on-man <laughs> -man action happening there. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. Yes. It's, not like they, like, it's not like they said, oh, you got some visitors. How about you send them out? We can go have a drink, yes. a little dancing. Mm -hmm. One thing might lead to another. Some you tea and crumbits. No. <laughs> what they were advocating and demanding was gang rape. Okay? Uh, yes. Um, now, my lifestyle with my husband, Glenn, doesn't look like that. I mean, we don't, like, go up into somebody's house and say, hey, you've got visitors from out of town. Could you send them out so we could rape them here <laughs> on the street? That's ludicrous. That's not how we right. roll, okay? Maybe some get this view. I don't never met those gays, but that, you know, that's not what we do. So clearly that text has nothing to do with my life and my relationship. So why should I feel that that condemns me? That has nothing to do with me. That has right. to do with other stuff. Precisely, yeah. precisely. So, you know, I, I don't see that, you know, I, for one, I, I don't think it's healthy to, to take a passage and say, well, the Bible says, because as a Bible scholar, I have to say that phrase is an inaccurate phrase. Dale Martin, who's a wonderful Bible scholar, he wrote Sex and the Single Savior, he talks about this. He says, the Bible doesn't say anything. It doesn't have lips. It doesn't have a tongue. It doesn't have breath. It needs humans to interpret it, to give it meaning. We just and had that it, conversation today because I've been you? doing so much research. I said, you will be amazed at so many different ways people interpret things. It's how they see it. Right, absolutely. And uh, rape and is not being gay. For, right? Yes. yes. Um, you, bring, you bring to it, yeah. And so, like, yeah, you can find stories of, men misbehaving badly and you can blame it on them being gay or there's other ways of looking at it but you could also find many examples of sexual and gender minorities in the bible that are essential and celebrated peterson a yeah. viewer wants to know have you ever found anything in the bible that says that it is a sin to be gay no no, there's no such thing in the Bible. 
I mean, there's English translations that make it sound that way. And that started with the King James Version, which is a, a translation. But we have to remember, there is no such thing as a Bible translation, because you're not just translating language, but you're translating culture. Mm-hmm. So it becomes a commentary. And so whenever you're reading, and if you don't know the original language and the history around it, you're reading a commentary of what people are suggesting this means. That's why one version is different from the other. And interestingly enough, the King James Version, which was uh, issued by King James, that was after there were all these uh, rumors about King James and his male lover. Whoa! What? Yeah, 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 yeah. If you just do a little search for King James gay uh, and, and, you know, or King James lover, and so there was like, in a way, it was like the whole like no homo thing. Like, oh no, 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 we need to say something bad about the gays because no, we don't want to be. We're not gay. No. So let's make a version of the Bible that is like so homophobic. <laughs> and that's where the word sodomy comes from. It comes from that translation. Yeah. And and so, and soon after that, in in England, you began to see more and more anti sodomy laws. And so you have to realize this wasn't a spiritual endeavor of understanding the scripture, but it was a calculated political message to to deflect rumors. Right. Um, is there a support group for um, ex-gay therapy survivors? Yeah, there's a, a Facebook group of ex-ex-gays, uh, and there is a, a group that I was a part of for a long time called uh, Beyond Ex-Gays. It's a group for ex-gay survivors. And the website for Beyond Ex-Gay is um, beyondexgay.com. And at that website, um, there's lots of testimonies and stories of people who talk about you know, their experiences and how they overcame the, the pain and the damage of reparative therapy. There's also lots of articles out there and a big survey that was done for people who have had XP experiences, and there's a way to connect with people through the community there. Okay. Um, let me ask you this. Did you know of any of the, um, going back to uh, Love and Action, uh, before I forget this, did you know of any of the therapists, if they had any type of, you know, their credentials or anything like that? At the time, I assumed everyone had credential. Uh, you didn't ask, right? They had titles like reverend and all this. Um, turns out virtually no one had any professional training. Oh, my goodness. I mean, John Smith himself, who was the executive director, um, the highest degree he held was a high school diploma. What? And, yeah. And yeah. nothing to say anything bad about someone with a high school diploma, but that doesn't mean that you can give out therapeutic and and theological uh, expertise, you know, because you're not an expert and you definitely don't have training in therapy. And so, you know, and so you had people who felt that they were doing good. They really believed they were helping people, but they really were misguided. Right. right. And being a reverend, let me just tell you how easy that is to do online. <laughs> it is even free. It doesn't even cost you anything. Yeah. Any, you know what? Yeah. You don't even have to believe in God. You don't even mm. have to ha- own a Bible. You just can go <laughs> online and say, I want to be a reverend. That's how easy it is. <laughs> I know because I did it. So I can marry gays. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Yeah, you're ordained. You really are ordained. <laughs> but it's it's that easy. And people look yeah. at that title and think, oh, he or she's a reverend. I must listen. Well, no, not necessarily. Is is the yeah. therapy still legal? Well, you know, it, it was legal for the longest time. I mean, you would go to a trained therapist back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and then in the early 70s, uh, homosexuality was declassified as a mental illness. It used to be a mental illness. Uh, and they're like, no, it's not a mental illness. And so it became um, something that was unethical to, to do. And now every major medical association and psychological association absolutely denounces it. Um, it doesn't mean that it's illegal, but it's unethical and you could lose your licensing. There are certain 
states now that have passed laws that make it illegal to do reparative therapy on teenagers in New Jersey, California, in particular, I think Illinois as well. And, there, and the uh, country of Malta is now pursuing that kind of legislation. But the problem is it's this church loophole. Right. It's so often, it's not happening in a therapist's office. It's happening at the altar when someone goes up for prayer or in the youth group or when someone goes to a Christian counselor who has a, doesn't have a license but has a certificate from some Christian program they went through. And even though some of these XK programs have shut down, the teachings still live on in those spaces. Right. Oh, gosh. Unfortunately. Yes. Um, and that's why I think former XK leaders need to do more to undo the damage and to go back to those churches and re-educate people about, you know, where they were wrong. And, and not just that it doesn't work, but it's harmful, and there's a much better way of, of caring for people. Yeah. Mm-mm-mm. Absolutely. Um, guys, if you're just joining us in the middle of this uh, interview, we have Peterson Toscano um, live with us today, and he's telling us about his experiences with Love in Action that was based here in Memphis, Tennessee, among other things. And so right now, Peterson, we want to talk about your many accolades and being in various magazines and your performances is really what I want to talk to you about. Tell me how you got into doing that. Well, I from a kid, I always was sort of a clown. I was the class clown, doing all kinds of funny voices and everything. And in fact, um, when I first went to college, I thought I was going to be a Christian missionary and I was studying theater because I thought, oh, I could use theater to share the gospel. And I went to a theater school in New York, and I was a bit shocked. There was this, you know, fresh-faced, young Pentecostal going to this theater school in New York, and the department was infested with homosexuals. Of course it was. <laughs> it was crazy. Of course. I don't know how the gays got involved with theater. It's insane. So, so it felt like a very unsafe space for me, for me trying not to be gay. So I actually repented of theater at about the age of 21 and um, gave it up for Jesus, put it in the closet with the rest of me oh, and didn't uh-huh. touch it for almost 20 years Wow! When I, after I came out. And then I began telling my story just to friends casually and, um, you know, and realized that it's a really sad, desperate, horrible story that needs a little bit of humor to help. And then when I decided to write a play, Doing Time in the Homo No More Halfway House, where I tell, tell my story through eight different characters. Uh, and it's probably the funniest thing I ever wrote because it's just so ridiculous. Um, <laughs> and it's so painful, but it all works because it's comedy beautifully. Hey, that's, that sounds uh, very funny. We're definitely going to have to look at that. How can our listeners go and look at some of your performances? Sure. Well, there's a couple of things up definitely on my YouTube channel, which is uh, just P2Son, the letter P, the number two, S-O-N. You can go to petersontoscano.com, and there you actually can download, purchase for download, a version of uh, Two in Time in the Homo No More Halfway House, the 90-minute production that was filmed in Memphis uh, when I retired that play. And I'm still traveling around North America and Europe doing shows. Uh, I'll be in New England in April for a month, and then I go to South Africa for a month. So there's still live shows that I do around the Bible. I tell all sorts of LGBT-friendly Bible stories, and I do a lot of um, climate change comedy where I look at climate change as an LGBT issue. Yes, I did see something about that. Can you just elaborate a little bit on that and are you trying to save the planet is that what you're trying to do with the climate change and well it's weird because i'm not like a green environmentalist person at all like that's so not how i'm wired but i am concerned about climate change as a human rights issue when i realized how people were affected by climate change then I was like, oh, this is very much about, like, my, my LGBT activism. It's about people and rights. And, um, you know, and so much we're, like, we're, they're pointing us, like, to polar bears, you notice. And, like, there was all this stuff about polar bears. 
I really don't care about the polar bears. I know it sounds horrible. It's a horrible thing to say. But I'm like, you know, they are big, vicious, dangerous creatures who, when they don't have seals to murder, they eat garbage. Yeah. They're nasty creatures. And I feel bad. You know, it's, it's sad. But you know what? The climate is not just warming in the Arctic, but it's also warming in Central America, where there's a disease that's spreading like wildfire, attacking coffee plants. Right. Well, we can't do with their, our breath. coffee. And it sounds terrible. I could live without polar bears, but a world without coffee? Oh, right? <laughs> right? We need to get crazy. that stopped immediately. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I'm kind of trying to help LGBT people see that we got skin in this game, and we actually have lessons to teach people. The lessons we learned in the HIV AIDS crisis and how we survived that plague and changed government policy climate activists could use some help and learn those lessons. And also, climate change affects our population specifically at times. I mean, right now, major storm, right, in, in the Northeast. And they're saying in part it's because of climate change, because of global warming. You're like, wait, snow, global warming? Yeah. Hello. But it's because since the, the atmosphere is warmer, more water is evaporated, and it's held up there longer. So when it comes down, it comes down in a bunch. So that's why we're getting more floods that we're seeing in Nashville and all over the place. And when it snows, we're getting these major snowstorms with tornadoes and crazy things. There's coastal flooding. And what happens to homeless people, particularly LGBT youth who are homeless, and there are plenty of them in Nashville and in New York, they don't like going to shelters right. because usually shelters are run by churches that are not friendly or they're very gender spaces where boys there, girls there. Well, what happens if you're transgender and your ID is different than your identity or if you're genderqueer? It becomes a hassle. So often those kids don't go to shelter. So who's looking out for them? What are our LGBT family values and you know are we aware of what's happening with our homeless kids particularly in a time of extreme weather which we're going to see more and more that to me is how climate change is an lgbt issue Mm -hmm. i did watch your youtube video concerning this and even you put a thought in my head about the elderly lgbtq (laughs) that are affected by you know the bizarre weather that we're having and when I spoke to you the other day, you're like, oh, it's unusual for you to be snowed in. You know what? It's getting more and more usual. As a matter yeah. of fact, um, I've um, seen snow. We've gone for several years without it. However, the last three years, I've seen more ice storms than yeah. anything. Yeah. And this girl doesn't go anywhere in the ice or the snow. And my clients know, oh, Kim's not coming today because <laughs> there's a bad forecast. <laughs> It could be sunny. And the open-toed high heel. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Those are my AKA tennis shoes. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. I, I totally um, agree with you there, Pearson. We should all be concerned about that. We are. I mean, it's our lives we're talking about. So. Um, well, and we don't realize that you know, and, and I think that you know. It's not to shame people into, like, behaving better or, you know, recycling. But it's, it, sometimes there's a generation that has to face something really big. And we're that generation. I mean, this is our World War II. Mm-hmm. Um, it, the next 40, 50 years are going to be extraordinary and will require extraordinary people. And we're going to live in new ways. And I think that we've learned so many great lessons to teach straight people and the mainstream about about living together, looking after each other, and, and, you know, and we have a job to look after our own people as well. Yes, we do. Peterson, when are you coming to Knoxville? <laughs> yeah, we want to, yes, when, you, when we get to see your beautiful face. I need to get back there. I've been to Vanderbilt a couple of times. In okay. fact, there's, uh, on YouTube, if you search for Peterson Toscano and Vanderbilt, there's a 90-minute lecture where I talk about uh, sexual and gender minorities in the Bible. Uh, and there's lots of those stories. So I, I, hopefully I'll get back to Vanderbilt at some point. I, I would love, I love coming down to Nashville, and I, I love having an audience that knows the Bible. Mm-hmm. These days I'm with a lot of Quakers in the Northeast, and they're lovely people, but 
they really don't know the difference between Abraham and Peter. I mean, they just like don't. Yeah. So it's nice to have people who know their Bible. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know what? You can. I went to church all my life at a very strict southern church but i don't know the bible like you do absolutely absolutely we were just taught uh hellfire and brimstone (laughs) (laughs) so it would be interesting to pick your brain or attend one of your sessions i i just i'm intrigued by you and i'm blessed by you child blessed (laughs) (laughs) well um if you if you want to hear more of my like character work, I have a podcast of my own. I love podcasts. That's why I call, called you, because I love, I love listening to podcasts. And yours has such a, a fresh feeling to it. it mm-hmm. It's professional, but it's also very personal. Mm-hmm. And it was funny. And I have to say, that's what I like. Like, the first one I listened to was your advice for straight people. How funny. And I was <laughs> laughing my ass off. But yet, everything you said was actually really serious, too. Yes. And so I think that I love that combination, and actually that's why I wanted to reach out to you. But I, I love podcasting, and I love working with music and, and characters. So my podcast is called Climate Stew. It's the show that takes a serious look at global warming, but doesn't try to scare the snot out of you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. So I do lots of comedy. I play lots of characters, including Elizabeth Jeremiah. From the Elizabeth Jeremiah Global Worldwide Ministries in Oh, yes, girl, yes. She shows up and Marvin Bloom, lots of podcasts. So you can get that at climatesview.com or like you with Spreaker and iTunes and TuneIn and Stitcher and SoundCloud. There's too many platforms. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, my gosh. That's great to hear. That's great to know. Uh, Peterson? I tell you what, we are very, very, very grateful that you reached out to us because um, we might not have uh, crossed paths otherwise. But if you're ever going to be in Tennessee, please call us. Uh, me and Kim, I mean, we plan on going to New York City possibly to meet oh. some others, um, podcasters that we had met um, Recently, uh-huh. so from the we, girls we know, hour. yeah, and you said that you've been to New York, so that's that'd be great to meet I'm up only there. Only three hours from New York. You let me know when you're coming up. We can, um, like you know, champagne. I think is just part of the, the picture, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll wear my open toed high heels. <laughs> Yay! It's a must. It's a must. <laughs> you no, know, I you know I, I'm I'm really grateful, and if you want me to come back sometime and just talk about LGBT friendly Bible stories, we can have a little Bible time. That could be fun. Yes. But you know, the other thing I like about your podcast is there are so many like gays and lesbians in New York and LA who kind of assume that everything is done that we're all loved and adored and everyone's gotten over stuff. But that's not true. I mean, you still have people dealing with families that won't accept them. You have people still struggling over their faith. You have straight people saying stupid things. And you are a podcast that's bringing that up and speaking to a big chunk of America that is not getting a message right now. And I really appreciate that. Right. Uh, That's especially... Uh, what you just said here in the Bible Belt in East Tennessee. <laughs> so, and that's where, <laughs> and that's where we're we're from. I would love for you to leave just a final note, to, maybe some encouraging word. Maybe someone might be thinking it's wrong to be gay. What would you say to those people? Well, I will end with. A monologue. It's my identity monologue where in two minutes to eight characters, I tell you my life story and I think it has a message to answer that very thing. So this is the identity monologue. I don't know why, but for much of my life I've struggled with issues of identity. Not only accepting myself, but even understanding who I am as a person. No, no, many people, they struggle with issues of identity, particularly the younger people. No, this is bad, this is terrible, this is a catastrophe. And I remember when I was growing up, shoot, I'd always be looking at other people to see how they live their lives. And I just wondered, what were they thinking about me? And what were they saying behind my back? And as a result, I wasn't always very honest about who I was. 
So then I tried to change all sorts of things about myself, you know, externally, the way I did my hair, the way I walked. Oh, my gosh, this one time I even joined the soccer team. Ugh, it didn't make any difference. No one ever treated me better, and I never felt good about myself. No sé por qué, pero trataba de cambiar muchas cosas en mi vida. Y gritaba al Señor, por favor, ayúdame, cámbiame, sálvame, pero sí me ayudó. And I don't understand why these issues of identity are so complicated, but for me they were. But after years of trials and tribulations, I finally came to the place where I understood who I was. I accepted myself. So now I can say thank you very much. Although the process of self-discovery is a very difficult process. It is a very important process all the same. And now when I look at myself in the <laughs> mirror and I see other people out and about, I often say to myself, They're the most beautiful people in the world, and the most powerful are those people who are unashamed just to be themselves. How awesome. Oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, Joseph, and Mary. Yes. That was awesome. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Are you kidding me right now? That is awesome. Peterson, you're my new best friend. Oh, my God. Oh. That was incredible. That was awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just met your LGBTQ prodigy. We love you so much. Absolutely. Hey, that was, that was great. That was great. I think I just came. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I said forget I just... it. <laughs> forget it. Forget it. I said what you think I said. <laughs> Thank you. you said? Yes, yes, baby. Yes, I did. Thank I you. Thanks to my husband after this. <laughs> Thank you so much for this lovely, wonderful, beautiful interview. I can't thank you enough. Mwah! Uh, oh, thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah. Well, um, anything I can do to help, I'm definitely going to be promoting your show. It's well worth people listening to. Thank you very much, Pearson. Guys, we hope you enjoyed tonight's or today's show. Sorry. <laughs> and um, um, please stay tuned. We're going to be having more of that, where that came from. And we're hoping that Peterson will bless us with his presence again uh, soon. I <laughs> And I am super duper uber excited about today. Thanks for joining us. Baby, I love you. I love you more. <laughs> All right, y'all get a room. Well, that's the end of the show. Have a question or want to put your two cents in? Send us an email or follow us on Twitter. But don't forget to subscribe for future shows because, well, you're nosy, and that's a good thing. Now, you don't have to go home, but you do have to get the hell up out of here. Ciao, baby. <laughs>